Introducing Arise Play, the number one streaming channel from the heart of Africa. Celebrating black talent and excellence in the world of entertainment. Blockbuster movies. I make this look good. Popular TV series. Let the game begin. Live music. Behind the scene action. Head on over to Arise Play and let's get woke together. My new series, Woke, is exclusively on Arise Play. Plus, so much more. Yes! What are you waiting for? Download the app. Or visit the website today to subscribe. Join a new world of entertainment. Arise Play, beyond streaming. Welcome to this week, 16 minutes of analytical review of the big stories, topical issues, and all the controversies around the world. I'm Somna Sambu. Our top stories. Central Bank of Nigeria sacks directors of First Bank Holding PLC and First Bank Nigeria Limited due to mounting insider loans and corporate misgovernance. Reinstate the embattled managing director, Shola Adedunton. We have analysis. Nigerian Senate amends AMCON Act to allow for quicker disposal of assets of debtors. All assets owned by debtor, whether used for collateral or not, will be seized and disposed of by the new law. And apprehension grows over the anticipated shortfall in Nigeria's Federation account following NMPC's Plan Zero Remittance. We have analysis. Plus, National Assembly and the opposition PDP call for a declaration of state of emergency on national security. But the Kassina state governor, Amin Masari, kicks against it, saying Nigerians should stop politicizing issues. We begin with Nigeria's Apex Bank, the CBN, as it sacks directors of First Bank Holding PLC and First Bank Nigeria Limited. The governor of the Apex Bank, Godwin Emefiele, cites insider abuse, insider credit access, and breakdown of corporate governance as reasons behind the sack. The CBN governor, however, reinstated Shola Adedunton as the managing director of the interim board. The CBN had queried First Bank over the appointment of Benga Shobo as the new managing director without its approval. Let's listen. The Central Bank of Nigeria, in line with its powers conferred on it by the banks and other financial institutions Act 2020, has approved and hereby direct as follows. One, immediate removal of all the directors of First Bank of Nigeria Limited and First Bank of Nigeria Holdings PLC. Two, the appointment of the following persons as directors in First Bank of Nigeria Limited and First Bank of Nigeria Holdings PLC. For the HOLDCO, one, chairman will be Remy Babalola. Two, 
Dr. Fata De Abiodun Olu Ole. 3. Kufo Doshekun. 4. Remy Lasaki. 5. Dr. Alimi Abdurazak. 6. Alaji Ahmed Mudibu. 7. Alaji Khalifa Imam. 8. Mr. Peter Aliogu. 9. Uke A.K. Managing Director. For the bank, we will now have from today Chairman as Tunde Hassan Udukale. 2. Tukumbo Martins. 3. Uche Nwokedi. 4. Adekunle Shonola. 5. Isioma Ogodazi. 6. Ebeniza Ulufuwushi. 7. Ishaya Elijah Dodo. 8. Dr. Shola Ade Dunton, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer. 9. Binga Shobo, Deputy Managing Director. 10. Remy Oni, Executive Director, we understand, had just been appointed Chairman of PENCOM and has proceeded on terminal retirement or terminal leave. So we will expect that this board will fill this vacancy shortly. All right, CBN Governor dear uh, Godwin Emefile talking about these new arrangements in the Central Bank, uh, in the First Bank of Nigeria. And I uh, will just want to correct that very quickly, that Remy Babalola, who is the former Minister of State for Finance in Nigeria, is actually the chairman of the Hold Co., which is the uh, holding company of the First Bank, while Shola Odunto. Uh, Ade Dunton is actually the uh, managing director of First Bank itself and he's in all of these issues. Well, for analysis on why the Central Bank of Nigeria sacked the board of First Bank, I'm now being joined in the studio by Professor Uche Uwaleke, who is a financial economist uh, and president Association of Capital Markets Academics of Nigeria. He's also a former commissioner for finance in Imo State. And via Cisco Webex, we have um, Associate Professor of Law, uh, Sam Amadi, who's a RISE News Analyst, joining us also. Uh, uh, so I'll just start with you here, Prof. Amin. <laughs> a lot of things unraveling in Nigeria's oldest bank. A lot of people were afraid during the week that it looks like Nigeria's uh, financial system is porous. Why did the uh, central bank have to wait till this uh, time to, first of all, inform us that First Bank had been under regulatory forbearance for about five years. That's a lot of right. people are shocked with that revelation. Let's start from there. Well, you're right. Um, not a few think that the central bank is wielding the big stick, you know, um, you know, a, a little late. But um, the explanation one can, you know, hold on to um, is the fact that the First Bank, as you know, is uh, one of the systemically important banks um, you know, we have in the country. Um, a bank that has um, outstanding shares of over 35 billion, a bank that has a um, deposit base of over 31 million, a bank that has, um, uh, if, if you look at the, um, the, the, the size of the deposits, you know, themselves, over 4.2 trillion, okay? In terms of shareholders' funds, we also hear figures in excess of 600 billion. Okay, and we also understand this is a bank that is doing businesses in over 800 business locations and has presence in, in 12 countries. So, um, it, it, it is an important you know, a, a bank, it's one of the leading banks in, in the country, and as such, uh, it, it issues concerning the bank, of course, must be taken you know, very carefully. So, that's the way I figure it. But overall, the central bank um, you know, took the right step. Um, in, in the actions that um, it has taken. Um, according to the central bank governor, the bank has, under, has been under um, watch uh, since 2016, uh, that the bank was operating um, fairly uh, okay up until that 2015, 2016, 16. when the central bank, um, uh, through its target examination, you know, noticed um, 
that uh, prudent, key prudential requirements were already you know being breached. Um, that's talking about the capital, uh, the um, uh, you know capital adequacy ratio, the CAR. The CAR is the ratio of um, a bank's um, capital, you know, to its um, risk assets, so risk weighted assets, which are you know the loans. Um, the other uh, prudential requirement is also non-performing loans. Um, as a matter of fact, high. yes, non-performing loans. Um, as of 2016, was as high as 24%. Um, of course, today is in the region of 7%. Uh, as we're talking about, uh, you know, first bank. So the uh, central bank said at that time it had to remove the MD. You know, uh, brought in Shola. Shola, you know, Adedutor, and also granted the bank for bearance. Um, you know, allowing it opportunity to you know work out uh, its um, you know non-performing loans. In addition, it also allowed the uh, you know the insider uh, insider loan the opportunity to restructure oh, 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 okay let's so, let, let just hear the views of uh, uh, sam amadi on this issue talking about the regulatory powers of the central bank to do this a lot of people said that uh, this should have been done much earlier than now and that uh, for the cbn governor to also have been calling uh you know one of the majority shareholders about two decades before taking an institutional decision it looks like the issue was being politicized what's your view well i think i will first say that um, clearly regulatory decisions as uh, evidence based and like what you said uh, you need to of course show what evidence the science the, the invest investigations reveal a risk that perhaps are uh, above the threshold of what the central bank would allow as potential. Again, after that, you need to also be rational in the sense of judging several factors, whether it's timely will be the impact and the consequence. So the delay, as some would say, might not be because of uh, deference to authorities. It might be because of judgment. A regulator does two things. You assemble the science, you apply the logic, they make a judgment call as to both the legality, the reasonableness, rationality, and of course, uh, the cost benefit analysis of impact, impact assessment. So I, I think that that's underlined. But again, the issue around calling the major shareholder, as the case might be, uh, goes with the level of independence of regulators in the country, in many, in many sectors. Uh, essentially, the central bank need not, because that call could lead to some degree of um, uh, some degree of uh, let's say influence peddling. So I think in respect of the central bank governor, it, it, is, it has to be a prudential guide. It has to be science based investigation. Once the facts make sense, and once the risk to avoid this has crystallized, or it's about to, the central bank need to act. So there will need for deference. But again, uh, if you look at the Nigerian um, economy, uh, uh, lack of independence is clear with regulators. The political economy is that of, of if you like, like influence peddling. Oftentimes, regulators themselves, the way they're appointed, the, the way they, they, they manage their process, and the expectations of those who are appointed, and even themselves, sometimes they feel that they need to respect certain uh, very important interests. So I think that uh, if the central bank, if the government made that, that call at, at the heat, or at the time of taking a critical decision that has impact on rights and, and liabilities, in the industry, in fact, that could even affect third parties, customers, uh, uh, customers of the bank, shareholders, and the general public. Then that's the wrong thing to do. But primarily, what's expected is that they should act precipitate, like uh, which I said. You don't just yeah, it's possible that this should have happened long ago. But then uh, the, the, the regulator has to apply the science, the logic, and to the facts, and also make a judgment as to what we'll have to go on a so short break now. And when we come back, I would actually want to find out from you if any law has been breached here. And if there is a law that has been breached, what will happen to the former chairman of First Bank and other persons who may likely be indicted? Well, it's time for a short break. There's more when we return. Stay with us.
Welcome back to this week. I'm Sumner Sambo. And we'll go straight to you, um, Sam Mamadi. Uh, in this issue, there were allegations of, uh, you know, a lot of non-performing loans. And uh, most of these loans uh, were due to insider loans being taken by some of the board members, those who had access uh, to the board and all of that. And one of the critical uh, person uh, that was uh, being talked about is uh, uh, about Two Deco and his company. And uh, there, there are lots of persons who have said that, look, a lot of things must have gone wrong there. And the CBN needs to let us know if anyone has breached the law. And if anyone has actually breached the law, then the law must take its course. What's your view about that? Well, clearly, under the BOFID and the CBN Act as well, the Central Bank has plenty of powers. One of them also include the power to sack, suspend officials, the power to take action against banks and individuals who default. And what it is they could do could be in the case of uh, of a total air official. If there are uh, conflict of interest issues and breach of uh, clear regulation or breach of ethical standards in managing the bank or chairing the board, the central bank can as well also place them in long, long term Ban. They could ban them from holding any position, honorary or executive, in the banking sector. Now, there's a limit to what criminal actions the central bank can uh, take against airing officials, including bank, uh, bank managers, bank chief executives, uh, and their board chair and members, because some of those crimes could border on economic financial crimes where the EFCC can come in. So the central bank can make references to EFCC where the criminal offense, infraction of criminal codes have crystallized and there could be other penal uh, uh, sanctions that are beyond the powers of the central bank. The central bank might not be in a position to make a clear education on very strict uh, criminal actions, except actions of that ancillary to management of the banks, in which case... Uh, all right. Take action for Oh, okay, just, just hold on there so that we'll have the views of uh, Professor Uche Waleke here. Uh, what's your view? Do you think there was any breach and um, what should be the next actions if there is established breach in the operations of First Bank? Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me start by saying that if you look at the history of bank failures in Nigeria, uh, you will see that um, um, a good number of banks um, failed in this country as a result of... Um, you know, these uh, poor corporate governance uh, practices as a result of um, insider loans. Um, there is this um, study done by the NDIC, um, you know, case study of bank failures in Nigeria. And um, two of them, two banks in particular, you know, talking about the then Commerce Bank and then Credit, um, you know, Bank, you know, had um, exposure to directors of the bank. Um, you know, in excess of, um, in the one case, 50-something percent, in another case, 70-something percent, you know, the, the percentage of, um, you know, loans, total loans given to directors, you know, amounted to that. Credit Bank then had four directors, and um, uh, the other one had six directors, and they gave them as much as 70-something percent of the total loans um, given out. So they were just so disbursing people's yes, uh, monies to themselves. Exactly. So <laughs> uh, that's why I said the central bank, you know, um, you know, took the right step. Of course, exercising its powers, if you look at the Bofia Act, uh, you can locate these powers within Section 12E, I guess, uh, and Section 34. Section 12E, you know, um, simply says that the central bank even has the right to revoke the license of a bank if it thinks that the directors of the bank are um, conducting the affairs of the bank in an unsafe manner. Now, talking about insider loans, the Bofia Act, um, again, Section 19 of the Bofia Act, you know, says that a bank is not allowed to allow uh, as outstanding, okay, up to one million naira, uh, you know, uh, credit facility to the directors. One million naira shouldn't be outstanding. And a bank, too, under Section 19, it still says that a bank is not allowed to give out credit facility in excess of 5% um, of uh, paid up share capital to directors. And even if, if you accumulate for all the directors, it shouldn't be more than 10%. And director is even defined as uh, uh, including all connected persons, whether the spouse, whether the son, whether the daughter, whether companies in which they have an interest. Okay, now, as yes. we try to round off this uh, <coughs> issue, very quickly now, we have heard of this forbearance arrangement and all of that, but one other interesting thing is that the central bank also, uh, the first bank also was also used as an institution 
to help those other smaller banks that were undergoing forbearance. And a lot of people have said that uh, 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 First Bank is an institution in itself and it mustn't be allowed to go down. But what's the, what does this say about the stability of Nigeria's financial system very quickly? Yeah, so I, I want to... Um uh, you know, believe the CBN governor when he, you know, gave that reassurance that the banking system is uh, stable. And one way to also look at that uh, uh, stability is to look at the finan financial soundness indicators. Um, again, the prudential requirements, whether it's uh, in terms of capital adequacy ratio, uh, where we understand, you know, the, 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 ab the average now is above 15%. Whether it's in terms of non-performing loans, we also understand it has come down to as low as 6.3%. Whether it's in terms of liquidity ratio, which we also understand is excess in, in excess of the threshold, you know, of 30 percent. So I think the banking sector um, is um, is stable. Okay. Mm. So then we'll now go on straight to you, uh, Dr. Sam Amadi. Uh, what does this say about the annual financial statements released by banks, which is monitored by the Central Bank of Nigeria? Because these loans were not reflected. This forbearance was not reflected in uh, the financial statements by the bank for over five years. What does this say generally about the CBN and whether people can actually, investors can trust the financial system in the country? Well, clearly, we, we believe that I want to call the behavior of regulated entities. Their behavior is to game the system. And so even the U.S., you see that it takes corporate competitors to point out loopholes in the filings of companies. So you expect that, the CDN should always expect that the filings that com companies provide based on statutory requirements are often either rendered, there are a lot of misrepresentations and underrepresentation. And so that's the work of regulators to do snap audits occasionally, to look at the books often, and to second guess, oftentimes run these filings with their competitors who normally have incentive to expose their competitors in order to gain market power or at least uh, have a competitive advantage. So I think that this tells us a story that we should always think that companies are going to do their best to either openly, openly game or cheat or underrepresent or underreport. And so the regulator must be stronger, both in terms of competence, in terms of capacity to get information, and in terms of its ethical, you know, uh, uh, makeup, so that it can always second guess, find out, and punish. Clearly, what uh, Facebook has done could be typical of the industry. It depends on. Oh, okay. Degree. Just before we go, I, will, I will want you to uh, talk about the amendment of the Amcon Act, which now gives it powers to seize all property of any debtor irrespective of where it's located within the country if the person has refused to pay his loans and then it's seen that he or she is still enjoying and living large uh, uh, i mean everywhere well i think two points quickly one is in terms of uh, huge bank loan default it's all the fraudulent loans uh, by insiders the public sentiment is to go for the queue we want the uh, CBN to always recover these assets as quickly as possible, sell them off, and make the money back. But again, we need to understand due process. That also, uh, those powers should be exercised three ways. One is that there must be discretions that are revealed by the court, which often is the case here. Second, there must be discretions that are size on record. What you call record, meaning that there must be decisions on record to enable judicial review. And thirdly, there must be decisions made to uh, uh, public rehearing, administrative rehearing, so that the central bank system should not develop procedures and rules for adjudicatory hearing. You cannot, by law. Uh, we we must thank procedures. you very much, uh, Dr. Sam Amadi, who's um, an associate professor of law and a rise news analyst. Uh, I would have loved you to actually answer the question, but unfortunately, we do not have enough time left. Uh, professor Uche Waleke, um, who is um, a former commissioner of information in uh, uh, uh sorry of uh commissioner of finance in emo state uh thank you so much for being with us on the show um thank you so much so we'll just go on a short break now and when we return we'll continue with other stories
Welcome back to This Week. I'm Somna Sambu. Tough times ahead as the three tiers of government, federal, states, and local governments may get fewer funds from the Federation account in the month of May, as the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation will be making a huge deduction for the payment of subsidies on petrol. In a letter by the NMPC to the Accountant General of the Federation, Ahmed Idris, the corporation says it posted a value shortfall of almost 112 billion naira in February 2021, which will ultimately impact on its ability to contribute to the joint account shared by the federal, state, and local governments. The NMPC has served a notice that it will not be able to remit any funds to the Federation account in April for distribution in May. This would impact hugely on the finances of states. One of the state governors reacts to the development. You have just said that the NNVC said they cannot even give money. I don't know the amount of chaos that would have caused because most of the states are dependent on federation accounts. And because of the cluelessness and the lack of capacity to manage the economy, we have found ourselves on this. There is even a blame game between the members of the party within the APC. So, I think we are not going to be arrogant. We knew the mistake we committed before, and we are taking steps, or we have taken steps to correct them. We are presenting Nigerians a better framework, a better platform for them to really actualize their aspirations. Well, I still have with me here Professor Uche Waleke, who is a former commissioner uh, for finance in the um, uh, emo state and uh, also be joined by other guests. Now let's just go straight to this issue. Uh, is NMPC breaching the law? Because what the law actually says is that whenever it gets all its funds, it should put them into the federation account. So it's the federal government and the states that should be telling Nigerians uh, that maybe subsidies won't be uh, subsidies are eating into uh, uh, the monies from the post. But we are surprised, actually, that it's NMPC that's telling Nigerians that it won't be remitting monies into the federation account. A lot of people are confused about this. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, that's the reality, uh, because if you noticed, since 2017, the issue of um, um, fuel subsidy, you know, what NMPC chooses to call on, on that recovery cost, you know, has always featured in the NMPC books. And um, I was looking at the NMPC fact reports for uh, the month of um, January and um, December 2020, which was shared, of course, um, in January, and that of January shared in, uh, in, in February. The remittance for 2020 was 72 billion, and uh, the following month it was um, 84 billion. And now that NMPC is saying that it's, it's, it's going to have a shortfall of over 100 billion, it means, uh, of course, there will be nothing to, um, you know, to remit. So that's worrisome, and that's coming because of the. Um, the fact that fuel subsidy is still there. Uh, we hear it's, it has now risen to as much as 76 naira, you know, per, per liter, you know, the subsidy on fuel, um, uh, which speaks to the need, uh, you know, to really address this issue. Because if we don't address it, the problem will, you know, continue. Yeah, that's why there. a lot of people are actually saying that NNPC as an institution is supposed to collect revenues and remit into the Federation account. So if there's a challenge, it should be that it's the, the three tiers of government that will sit back and say, okay, this is the issue here and there, not an agency of just the federal government talking to the entire federation and saying this is the issue. So in this instance now, yeah. what do we also expect the states to do since NMPC is the largest contributor to the FAC account? Yes. No, I, um, of course, the other major contributors are FIRS and um, uh, Customs, and then to a very small degree, the Ministry of Solid Minerals. Yes. Uh, these are the uh, four major sources. But I think in, in this uh, uh, process, the states, the subnationals um, will be carried carried along because uh, if you look at FAC, FAC is um, uh, made up of um, um, you know state states commission for, for finance. Um, you know, um, of course, yeah, accountant, accountant generals also generals, you know yeah. come, and of course chaired by the honourable minister for finance. So I think this, the states are going to be uh, you know carried along um, uh, in these kinds of. Um, uh, a decision, but as I said earlier on, the real challenge is uh, doing something, doing something, you know, about this um, subsidy. Remember, NMPC is now the, about the, the the sole um, uh, agency, you know, doing this importation, and um, that is why you find that cost, you know, appearing in the books of um, NMPC. So when it gives this report, you know, uh, naturally it tends to deduct it before remitting whatever to the federation account. 
But uh, uh, you're right. You're, you're right. It's, um, a federation account is something that belongs to the, the three tiers of government, and the states and subnationals you know, must be carried along in whatever decisions that um, the uh, NMPC oh, Okay, joining us right now is uh, Jibrim Babandache, who is a journalist and uh, an editor with uh, Blueprint Newspapers, yes. and uh, you have also been in the States as the chief press secretary to a governor. When you hear things like this, how does it present uh, uh, the states before their people? Because a lot of states will be unable to pay salaries, uh, for May, for June, what will this portend for, <laughs> I mean, uh, governance in those states? It portends a uh, huge danger, uh, not just for, and when you look at this, sometimes we tend to look at just a few states. But what I tell people is that even the states that are considered as oil producing states, when you remove the oil economy, what are those states producing? What are they bringing to the table? I think that there are two important lessons from this. One. Even in the angle of security, a country like Nigeria, in quest of national power, should not be dependent on any country in terms of uh, foil. That is one. But if we also want to be taken serious as a nation, for instance, the issue of oil, oil foil subsidy has been going on for the last 20 years. I mean, we heard the so, so, say that so what is it? Is it so, it so, comes so, back and, and then now, from what uh, uh, the NNPC is telling us, is NNPC putting precedence on those that will receive full subsidy to the detriment of civil servants in the state. In many of the states in, this, in the Federation, they depend on uh, FAC allocation. But the biggest lesson is that we have been talking about alternative to oil and making state very viable to make them contribute uh, uh, to the table. And I'm, looking, I'm talking about all the states. If you look at, you look critically, north, south, all the geopolitical zones, states are not bringing enough to the table. And this is going to bring, put a huge pressure on state so governance. Let's, let's talk about internally generated revenues mm. in the states. Do you mm. think this will be able to help shore up the revenues that will come to the state while Abuja's revenue is reduced due to the yeah, removal they, of the NMPC I, I, revenue? This is our next part. He will talk to these issues more. But revenue is a process. It's not something that is about sport at the moment. And you, the, the major challenge that we have as a nation is that when issues happen, we talk as if that the world will end that day. But after that, we'll, we'll forget about everything. There has to be thinking, rethinking of our own strategy about this oil subsidy. For instance, why is it that it has become uh, something that is almost impossible to, 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 to do away with? Why is it that we have been talking about every day? What is it that we have not been able to achieve? Why is it that our refinery is not working? If you want, for instance, states should look at comparative advantage and issues of plan, uh, planning. Uh, developing tourism, agriculture, and <laughs> all other the face of opportunities. And face we of don't see uh, tourists coming to Nigeria mm -hmm. at the moment until that issue is solved. But let's go to that issue that asks him, which is on the alternative sources of revenue to the states now. If the NMPC, which brings a huge chunk into FAC, doesn't bring that. Yes, customs will remit. You have the company's income tax and uh, all of that. But in, in, in the states, do we have any states that have the capacity to actually show up their revenues uh, within this short period of about two to three months so that they will augment the shortfall that may come from Abuja? A very few. Um, uh, if you can count them, you know, on your <laughs> one hand. Um, Lagos State, yes. Uh, maybe River State, yes. And um, maybe um, Ogun. Uh, Ogun State? Ogun. Ogun. Maybe. And then maybe Kaduna. Kaduna yes. <laughs> And um, if you also notice, these are states that have um, imbibed this, um, you know, um, fiscal transparency and accountability, um, you know, process. Um, even starting with the low-hanging fruits, what I call the low-hanging fruits, and that low-hanging fruits also, you know, speaks to the issue of, um, you know, transparency, the issue of uh, even cutting costs. Okay. Well, um, the Kaduna State Governor has said he's going to cut costs, yes. which will mean him actually shedding uh, some of the staff. But the Nigerian Labour Congress is mm -hmm. up in arms against the Kaduna State no, government. No, no, While the Kaduna State government is saying that just a few number of uh, uh, the people in its bureaucracy, the civil servants should not be taking a huge chunk of the monthly allocations that come into the state. No, How do we resolve no, this no, both? No, cost reduction is not about um, you know, laying off staff, no. That's, that's, that's not what, what it's all about. What it's, all, it's, also, it's also about cleaning up the payroll. 
It's about ensuring that you don't have, um, you know, uh, good staff. Okay. It's about ensuring that you have a lean government. You don't have um, um, an over bloated uh, cabinet, for example. Okay. You look at your number of mi ministries and see how you can ra rationalize, rationalize them. And then uh, prioritizing your spending. Okay. And in that pri prioritizing spending, must give preference, of course, to workers' um, uh, salaries after you have cleaned up, cleaned up the payroll. And this is also the time for states, as I, uh, you know, to also position themselves to also get grants. The World Bank still has um, a grants, and surprisingly, some of the states are not even attracting these grants because they are not complying with the basic requirements, you know, such as publish your budget, for yeah. example, such as um, operate a treasury single account, for example. <laughs> it's not only that of the World Bank. Even yes. the UBEC funds, the UBEC a funds lot of are states are exactly unable they because they don't meet the So they are having basic things, low-hanging fruits, um, you know, they, they need to tap into. I, I, and I just want to ask them. you this. This yes. new Amcon uh, uh, Amendment <laughs> Act that yes. has been passed by the Senate, which we hope the uh, House of Reps will also pass, yes. if it comes into effect very quickly, do you think that the states can take advantage of this to actually go after debtors to uh, who owe them money to actually repay very quickly. Yes, I, I seize their assets and all of that, just like the law says. Yes, um, it, um, that is if Amcom also ha has that has such powers, okay? Because Amcom is to recover the um, you know um, federal debt. No, no loans oh, owed, okay, owed to loans banks because these loans are owed principally to the Central Bank of Nigeria. But you have made a point, and um, that also speaks to expanding the um, you know business model of Amcom. I, I, because there are lots of companies that are owing yes. uh, taxes to yes. state governments I was and in, then uh, yes. individuals yes. too, and they, they haven't paid yes. for it. Yes, I was in South Korea uh, two years ago to also you know, look at um, the, um, you know, the asset re resolution um, uh, mechanisms in, in, in South Korea. And I went to uh, the city of Busan. Busan is where, where they have the uh, Korean um, asset management company, the Kamco. Okay, and we took you know lectures there, and part of what they said is that Amcom is not just um, uh, there to resolve um, you know uh, bad um, loans. That Amcom also uh, helps the government also recover uh, overdue taxes. Amcom in South Korea, for example, helps the government to sell, uh, seize the um, uh, you know uh, properties. So the, it goes beyond just um, recovering loans. So and of course, if their uh, the, 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 their their scope is expanded, states of course, state government um, would no doubt. Um, uh, okay, benefit. just before we go on break, I just want you to tell me how a lot of these governors will be sleeping. I mean, for two months, if you are not going to be having a, a, a lot of revenues come from from I Abuja, can, can, do you think some of them will run I away can, from their I states and come permanently to Abuja? My, my <laughs> other brother here who was also a commissioner in the state, you know that governors cannot sleep. With this announcement, no governor, 36 states, or except a few states that he has mentioned, no governor, because quite a number of states, very many number of states Niger in Nigeria are civil service states. Yes. They, they civil servant state, they civil service state, they depend on solely on, solely on, on uh, this thing. And like I mentioned earlier, the issue of internal generating revenue, it's a process. It's not something that you get today because there is no fact, and then tomorrow you think your revenue uh, uh, will we sure, uh, we sure No. You have to also look at the comparative advantages of your own state, which will require two, sometimes even uh, okay. three years to be able to... Uh, uh, yeah. All right. The best way to uh, empower, states, very quickly, mm, yes, empower states to show up their IGR is to devolve powers to states. Restructuring, yeah, the restructuring, restructuring, the restructuring yeah, will be, I mean, that debate has been on over and over. Yeah, exactly. if to 52 percent for federal government mm -hmm. is yes. just too much. Mm -hmm. Well, we would like to thank you, Professor Uche Uwaleke, who uh, is uh, a former commissioner for finance in um, Imo State. He has been with us all through. Uh, and uh, he's also a lecturer at the university close by here in Abuja. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would like to thank you for being with us. We'll just go on a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue on some of the issues we have. Stay with us.
Welcome back to This Week, where we hold the best of conversations and analysis. I'm Somna Sambo. The People's Democratic Party is asking the federal government to hold a brainstorming national security meeting with all Nigerians who can help it tackle the killings and insecurity in the country. The chairman of the party, Uchi Sekondo, said the insecurity situation in the country was becoming worrisome and should be promptly addressed particularly to ensure smooth conduct of 2023 general elections. However, Kasina State Governor Amino Masari has kicked against the growing calls for the state of emergency on security. Well, I still have with me Jibrim Babandache, who's a security and defense editor with Blueprint Newspaper here in Abuja. He's also a former chief press secretary the Niger State Governor. And then we also have uh, Associate Professor of Law, uh, Dr. Sam Amadi, who's uh, joining us uh, to also take a look at these issues. And let me just start with you very quickly. When you hear the op major opposition party calling for a state of emergency in the country, what do you make out of it? He has got a quick reply. I mean, they've got a quick reply from an APC governor who's also from the home state of the president uh, saying that, no, it's just politics, playing politics uh, with uh, it. You know, uh, Simon, this is the issue. Going back and forth on an issue that is of we should have a consensus. One of the biggest challenges we have as a nation is that there is no elite consensus on where we want to go, what we want to achieve. Uh, you, you talk about uh, a, a national summit. Uh, how many summits have we had in the past? What are the issues that we are going to raise new about this summit? What is it? For instance, when you look at some of these challenges, is it today that we've been facing these challenges? What is it that we're doing differently? What are the learned lessons? And this is what you find in other part of the world. When nations are faced with challenge, they look beyond the political parties, they look beyond religious differences, they look beyond differences. In our own case, when there are issues, when there is one attack or one, uh, one issue, a security issue, and then you see all over uh, the media, comment by one political party, this person said this, the other person said But I think that we need to know that w what are the things that we need to do differently. And sometimes, especially now, the idea of this blame game saying the security agencies are not doing enough. No, all over the world. The security well, agency well, cannot the, rise the above... The opposition party says it has rendered enough support to uh, the federal government, yet nothing seems to have changed. Yeah, because, because <laughs> we are dealing with unconventional warfare. And if you look at it... Which was also dealt well, with by the same PDP when it, they were in power. Yeah, so w the point I'm making is that, like I mentioned here two weeks ago, we're in the age of durable disorder. We should not pretend that this thing will go now. All over the world, criminal non-state actors are testing the will of sovereign nation. You just see America pulling out of Afghanistan, Afghanistan. after over 20 years. Oh, okay, uh, just, just hold on there. Let's um, speak with you, um, Dr. Sam Amadi. When you see the major opposition party calling for a national security summit, saying that the president must act because it looks like a lot ha has actually uh, gone down with a, a serving governor of the APC in Niger State, which is close to Abuja here, crying that the Boko Haram has hoisted his flag in his state, and if nothing is done, they could get to Abuja very close by. What do you make of that call for a declaration for uh, a, 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 a summit uh, for a state of emergency, and then um, also to gather leaders to talk about all of these issues? Well, I think uh, maybe the PDP uh, leader didn't use the right word. And I, I don't disagree with my colleague because the crisis we are facing now is not just about asymmetrical warfare. This is not just about Boko Haram. It's going to be a long night with Boko Haram because of the nature of the crisis. But we're talking about plain insecurity, plain inefficiency of police. We never had this way. This country, look, I, I'm just in, in the a rural area now in, in Owerri, and the conversation around this place is a conversation against the federal government, lack of faith in the government. Lack of faith in the integrity and processing of police. Simple thing as we caught this criminal, we caught this header, we caught this uh, militant, hand over to the police, and the police prosecute that person. Something as simple as that, not rocket science. The country can't do that. So, two things here. One, I don't think you need a summit to develop a technical solution to solve this problem. It's plain incompetence of the Bureau administration, A to C. There are too much incompetence. And of course, again, maybe the wrong people are the right place, right people with wrong motivation, 
right people with wrong instructions and right direction. The second issue, which I think the PDP is talking about, is the issue of recreating what my colleague called aid consensus, recreating threat in the Nigerian state. The biggest driver of insecurity and what makes it more, more dangerous is the loss of faith in the Nigerian project. That's what the presidency doesn't understand. I was a keynote speaker in NBA conference you know, yesterday, and I was talking about security using the US Supreme Court examples and jurisdictions and jurisprudence to show what should be done with the structure. When I finished, see the faculty of Nigeria, a professor of law said, Sam, you are pulling punches. This country should be out and out. And was saying, God bless none the Khan, a professor. I'm not talking about rabble rouse, I'm talking about racist youths. There's a total loss of faith in the country. And that's oh, what okay, just, just, just hold on there. Let's have your views. When you hear the Niger State governor, whom you had worked under, calling for federal help, saying that, look, these guys have taken so many villages and all of that. I need help. I need urgent help. Abuja, send help. What do you make out of that call? Well, having worked closely with him uh, beyond the cameras, having known his concern, his effort in the la at least between 20, uh, 14, 2015 and 2019, and I also w w followed the, the, what's happening in the state closely between 2019 and now. I think that for the governor, for His Excellency Governor Abukasan to come out loud and clear like that, he means that he's been pushed to the wall uh, because I know that a lot of support has been given to our, the security agencies to, in time of uh, uh, logistic, in time of buying vehicles, in time of even motivation. There was a time, once upon a time, that there was even air surveillance which was being supported by Niger State government. And yeah, I also recall that when I was uh, there, he visited uh, almost all the chief of army staff, then chief of air staff, just to have increased boot on the ground. Then uh, uh, the I mean, Niger the State national, is the so largest. It's the largest country. You see, uh, and a lot of people are you know, afraid. you know, Niger State. One of the biggest challenges in Niger State, and I said it. We've said this now. Niger State is a special case. Niger State should be treated like when you go around other part of the world. States that are adjoining to the federal capital of countries have special uh, treatment. And Niger State, in our own case, is the largest state in Nigeria with so many land uh, land uh, mass areas, on which are areas, ungovernable areas ungovernable where nothing is happening, where nothing is which happening, is where, these guys which are where all these criminals are, are trying to to, to now, occupy. Now, now, so, uh, considering that Niger State has two former heads of state who are from there, uh, former uh, head of state uh, General Ibrahim Babangida, mm. uh, uh, former uh, head of state yeah, yeah, General Abdul Salam Abubakar, mm. and even the governor's father yeah. is a former military general. Yeah, what do you make of this? I mean, you talk shouldn't about he have Niger, used these people to get in touch with Abubakar to do the needful? Niger State is a state of generous. And he no, calls the state, the state of uh, the power the state. state. You see, but it's <laughs> beyond that. This, the uh, elder statesmen, uh, Jeram Babangida and Jeram Salam and Konesan Bilo that I mentioned and others, they are people who understand power. They have to be very careful. Of course, when they get in touch with the president and commander-in-chief, of course, they will not talk to us. They won't have to let us know. And I know that even just a few weeks, a few days before the governor went back to the state, to, he was joined other, other governors here and met with the president. You know, So it's, uh, he, he, I think that he that loud cry he said, it's a wake up call that whatever is well, being it's done. It's a wake up call yes, for Abuja. Yes, they because need we have to so many more. senators crying yes. on the floor yes. of uh, the Senate yes. calling for urgent <laughs> help before it gets to Abuja. Now, as we try to round off very quickly in 30 seconds, uh, Dr. Sam Amadi, what is the solution? Since the PDP solution uh, calling for an emergency security summit has been uh, uh, pushed aside by you, what should be done by the Buhari administration? I think the Buhari administration should mix kinetic approach, firepower, with dialogue, with conversations around rebuilding social trust, conversations around recreating community vigilance. This is now the right time to think about functional reform of the Nigerian policing system, the law enforcement system. So yes, it's right that the crisis is getting bigger, 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 and all the stakes are not with the government. But clearly, something is missing, leadership. That leadership will require an expanded conversation with Nigerian leaders. All, all, all right, uh, Dr. Sam Mamadi, we just have to go at this uh, time. But we we'll want to thank you for joining us uh, right from your uh, place there in uh, Oweri, where you are resting, and we hope to have you back in Abuja very soon. Thank you for joining us on the show. I also want to thank you, uh, Jibrin uh, Babandache, who is a defense and security editor with Blueprint Newspaper. Thank you for joining us. And earlier on, we had Professor Raf Uwaleke, who is a former commissioner.